imprison those who are the followers of Jesus to imprison people like us, Christians. That's right. We're going to look at how God turned him around from a man with hate issues to a man who ended up writing half of the book of the New Testament in the Bible. An apostle. He was sincerely passionate about this crusade of getting rid of the Christians, and yet when God got a hold of him, his life was turned around. How many of you believe God is the best turnaround artist this morning? Hallelujah. He was a man determined to persecute the Christians. In a span of days, become a minister for Jesus. Whether we are on a starting, here's the point, whether we are on a starting point in our Christian faith, or whether you have grown up in church, or whether you have been a believer for decades, God can do something amazing, back to slide please, thank you, in your life right now. Everybody say right now. Right now. In fact, God wants, He wants to do amazing things immediately right now. Because we have a tendency, folks, to say we just want to put it off. We want to put it up. We want to procrastinate. One day I'll be holy enough, probably. One day I'll read the Bible enough. Probably someone is saying, I'll be a super saint sometimes. Or probably a hyper holy man in the future. Then I can start ministering. Then I can launch my own life group or a community group. Well, I'm here to, I'm here to tell you today that that day is today. You don't have to wait till you finish a degree to start ministering. It's not as to be involved in church governance. That's a different uh, kind of leadership. But on the screen, allow God to work through your life today. Once again, everybody say today. today. Allow God to work through your life today. Amen. You can minister right now. Right now, folks. Imagine a whole church, everyone, young and old, all believers, ministering. Can you imagine that with me right now for just a few seconds? What you are imagining is what's been happening or what happened in the book of Acts, the church when it started. So I'm truly blessed with people like Josh Brady, who are under the discipleship group of uh, John and Melanie Roque, who's now ministering to the children's Amen. church and the kids' church. The kids can get, it, can get it up in the sky. I mean, because he's been really falling in his life. Uh, he's been uh, baptized just about a year ago. And now he's already serving, just a few months ago. Also the Bautista family, who recently been saved, and now they're flourishing in the worship ministry. Hallelujah. So you can see the guitar player, the drummer, the bass player. Yeah. Arby yeah. having his own life group with his brother, his, uh, his, his, and also his sister, and also his friends. Praise the Lord for their lives. So this is the kind of things that we're excited about here at Charisma Christian Center. When I was a younger believer, I thought that in order for me to become a qualified minister is to achieve a super saint status. Much like in a role-playing game. Anybody play role-playing RPG? Uh, role in my days, it's Zelda. <laughs> Nintendo. Uh, but uh, when you have to level up until you are good enough to, do, to defeat the next level, you know, sometimes we think about that. And I thought about that and said, maybe... When I, was, when I was younger, maybe I could just level up to become some sort of a super, super minister so I can start to, to, uh, to pour my life out to people. But on the slide, please, I invite everybody to turn their Bibles in Acts chapter 9, verse 1. We are continuing this journey after Jesus rose up from the dead through the life of a man named Saul. And we'll study together how he was transformed from a man who hated Jesus to a man who would die for Jesus. The title of my message today is Minister Saul. Saul's journey to ministry. On the next slide, I compiled pictures from a long, long, long time ago in a place far, far, far away. Uh, uh, those are my family. Uh, we were kids that time, and my father brings us to what we call crusades. In that time, it's called Gospel Explosion in the 1980s. Um, I was looking at the, uh, the preachers, and I was listening to them and saying, in my mind, at a young age, 
how can I start to minister to people? I was inspired by the preachers. My dad exposed me to preachers like, if you guys are familiar with Reinhard Bonnke, Benny Hinn, and the likes of them, I thought to myself, how can I be like these people? Now, that's some, somehow I might memorize the scriptures better. That's good. Do I have to have a ministerial title? That's also good. Do I have to earn credentials? Serve a tenure? All that is good. But without all that, would I be able to still minister? Acts chapter 9, verse 10. Imagine you just got saved several days, baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, and you are ministering right away. What do you imagine for? To the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Let's pause there for a minute. He has no remorse whatsoever about imprisoning women and children. And I looked at my two children, one ten-year-old and one two-year-old. I cannot bear to imagine them being put in prison or a camp in that age. Both of us can with our own children. Probably some you can take my children. I'm just kidding. <laughs> now Saul, take my children. They're yours. <laughs> now Saul is, in my mind, would be tantamount to an extremist, a terrorist, because he would kill Christians and he would imprison children and women. See, he's not a good man at that point in his life. He seriously, he sincerely and passionately hated Jesus and his followers. He hated Jesus. He hated. Us, the Christians. Yet, God had a great turn around plan for his life. Listen, do not underestimate God's ability to change lives. You may have given up on certain people, certain loved ones, but God hasn't. Amen. He hasn't given up on them. As hard headed as we are, God is more hard headed. And more persistent mm. in loving them. Yeah. Don't give up on them. Do not underestimate the power of God to change people's lives. In verse 3, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And here's the phrase that taught me Who are you? Lord. Everybody say, Lord. Lord. He didn't know it was Jesus at that time. Can you imagine that? To recognize God's voice, but didn't know it was Jesus. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. If you look at the Bible, it's chapter 9. He knows it's God. He recognized his voice. What an encounter. Saul had an encounter with Jesus Christ. Himself. And we're trying to answer this question, where can we find the biblical picture of ministry? We find it in Acts chapter 9. How do we become a qualified minister? When can we start to minister? And what is the process to become a minister? Now, to, the initial step to ministry is we need an encounter with Jesus Christ. Everybody here with me? Amen. Amen. And in other words, everybody needs to be saved. Everybody here. Needs to have an encounter with Jesus first. Encounter with his love. I am Jesus, he said. Can you imagine when Saul heard that? Lord, I know you're God. Who are you? I am Jesus. Oh. You're Jesus, the one I tried to kill? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Can you imagine that moment? He replied, now get up and go to the city and you will be told what you must do. See, the moment you acknowledge God is your Lord of your life, you will be told what
what to do by Jesus, by God. That you are no longer the Russell Wilson of your life. You no longer call the plays in your life. You are no longer the boss of your life. It is Jesus. It is God. See, this is anti-culture here in Pacific Northwest, correct? In a proportionately small population in the state, we have such a high concentration of giant global businesses, right? A high concentration of business people. A lot of people who do not want to have any boss. That's my point. That's one cultural factor Factor on what Washington is probably one of the most unchurched state. Because the culture here, everybody's the boss of themselves. They don't want any other boss, not even God, to rule over them. See, the moment you acknowledge God is your Lord of your life, you will be told what to do by Jesus, by God. We all need to be saved. We have all need to accept Him boss of our life. Moving on. Verse 7. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. Saul got up. Everybody say got up. So that's, you get an experience with God. You get slain, that's good. But at some point, you have to get up. From the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand in Damascus. For three days, he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. He started fasting there. He didn't even know. After the encounter with Jesus, at some point, we need to get up. Now, in verse 10, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision. Ananias! It's an exclamation point. I can't shout in the mind. Yes, Lord, he replied. See, Ananias was a disciple. Not an apostle, not an official, not a Pharisee, not all of that. He's just a disciple, a regular dude, just like you and I, a believer. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. So he's giving the address, the specific address, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. Going off a little bit of a tangent here, for he is praying, but this is such a crucial insight, I can't resist. For he is praying, in other words, because he is praying, correct? Because he is praying, you go there. That's what God is saying. This passage implies that had he not been praying, God would have not sent the answer to his healing, correct? Had he not been praying, God would have not sent Ananias, the one who's going to disciple him who later on discipled Saul, who eventually became Paul the Apostle. How many times do we miss God's answer? Here's the point. God's instruction. How many times do we miss God's will for our lives? Simply because we neglect to pray. For he is praying. I can just imagine Ananias saying, wait, 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 wait. Lord, the Saul from Tarsus, right? Did I hear you right? Lord, let me just make sure I'm hearing you right. You want me to meet up with the hand of the terrorist group, correct? That's the one you're talking about, Lord. I just want to be clear, all right? The killer, the guy who imprisoned women and children, the enemy, the crazy dude, Lord. That's the one, right? I want to confirm. Are you crazy, Lord? Maybe that's what he's saying in his mind. See, no matter how bizarre it is, so long as you heard from God the way Ananias did, Let's do it. Maybe you're going to be afraid. Do it afraid. In verse 12, in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. It's going in his mind. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. To arrest me, Lord. That's what he's saying. But Lord, said to Ananias, but the Lord said to Ananias, here, here it is again, exclamation point, go! That's what he said. Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles. Now, if you heard from God the way Ananias did, there's a confirmation from the other party as well. Just do it. 
Maybe you're afraid to do it. Just do it afraid. As long as it's from God. Go. God said go. He will be a great minister. Just go, Ananias. By the way, he's also going to write half of the New Testament. Just go, Ananias. Do what I'm telling you to do. Do not underestimate God's ability to change lives. On the screen. Do not underestimate God's ability to change lives. The Ananias, then Ananias, went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, he made a disclaimer right away. It's not me, it's Jesus, all right? Don't kill me. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, as you are coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Everybody say this with me. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. What is the prerequisite to minister? According to our passage, you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Only the power of the Holy Spirit will be effective, folks. Because a few weeks ago, um, uh, I remember uh, when we had that great game with the Green Bay. Uh, <laughs> you just connect with anyone. You go to the barber shop, just go, oh, yeah, as if you know that person for 10 years already. You don't know that person, right? And it's like you go to Safeway and everyone's high climbing. There's an instant connection right there. You guys are like best friends. People, the first time you saw them, it's like, go home, can I go home to your best friend? Now, I mean, all that, I ask, God, how can we have this much of an impact to the people around us? To the people in our workplace, our schools, our hangout groups. And I thought about that and I said, we can, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. It says in the Bible, you may see again, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Only with the power of the Holy Spirit will we become efficient. In Matthew 4, even, this seems to be a prerequisite to minister as Jesus laid down the principle when he went up fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And he overcame the devil. He overcame the temptation. It fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. And he got up and, everybody say, was baptized was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. So let me tie this thing together right now. On the screen is what happened to Saul. What happened to Saul? First he had an encounter with Jesus. He was saved. What happened to him? He was filled with the Holy Spirit. What happened to him? He was baptized in water. Saul was saved for how long, according to the passage? You did. Several days. Did say several years? Several months? Several decades? Said several days. Saul spent several days. And then I started discipling him, started to lay foundations on him, biblical foundation. One to one. Just telling him this is what we believe in. Jesus is the Messiah. Remember. Saul thought that Jesus was not the Messiah. Now he's, he's being thought, hey, Jesus, Jesus is rich. He's the Savior. He's being disciple. See, once you meet Jesus, and you have an encounter with Jesus, you have to have biblical foundations laid up on you by a mentor, by someone. Moving along, all of us needs an Ananias, folks. Saul still has hair his hair still wet from baptism, several days saved. Then it says on verse 20, at once, and you want to say at once. He began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. How long has Saul been a believer of Jesus? Baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, discipled? Several days. So let me ask you this. You think he still has some anger issues in his life? Yep. You think he still has a little bit of that hate issues in his heart? Yep. I think he did. I think he did at that time. Remember, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Do you think he still has some racial issues in his heart? That anyone that is outside his ethnicity, he looked down upon, do you still have the that sin? I think he did at that time. But remember, you think maybe he still has some bad thoughts. That thoughts that weren't sanctified. Or did he become perfect all of a sudden? 
Is it the first or the second? I think it's the first. When he got saved, he went through the same stuff that we are going through right now. But it did not stop him, or it did not stop God from working in his life. He allowed God to work with him, even through the issues. See, do not let that issue, do not let that flaw, do not let that weakness stop God from working through you. Ariel, in my life group that I'm leading, everybody became a good Hindu after a month. No, I'm not talking about that, right? That's why you also need to be in a life group. Be having an analysis over. Disciple you. Someone also mentoring you. That way you don't end up making your own religion. Now, so long as you are one page ahead of in the Bible, you can disciple. You can pour out your life to someone on the screen says progress, not perfection, folks. Progress, not perfection. It says on the Bible, where did I get that? From glory to glory, God is changing us. From glory to glory, there's progress. Amen. Acts 9.20, at once Saul was a brand new believer, his hair still dripping with water from the baptismal tank, filled with the Holy Spirit, Preach Jesus in the synagogues immediately. Had he been a DJ, he would have went, went, went back to the course and preached there immediately. Had he been a Marine, he had gone back to his platoon and ministered there. Had he been a musician, he went back to his band and ministered with his bandmates. You know, once you get an encounter with Jesus and you experience the Holy Spirit, you're saved. You start ministering. Let's not get comfortable. It's good to huddle here. Yeah, it feels good. But let's go back to where we came from and minister to these people as well. Just as Saul did when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, was baptized, and he was saved. Now, these are the questions. Where can we find the biblical picture of ministry? We answered it in Acts chapter 9. How do we become qualified ministers? First of all, be saved. Be a disciple. And have a biblical foundation laid out on you. Be baptized. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Number three, when can we start to minister? The answer is as soon as possible. As soon as possible, folks. Verse 22, yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior. After many days, after, everybody say, after many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But this is what baffled me. But his followers, he already had his own life group after many days. He already had followers. Took him by the night and lowered him in a basket to an opening in the wall. I hear the story. You know, I want to make a difference. A little boy, I want to make a difference uh, with, the, uh, with the sea creatures. How can I say dying on the seashell. The boy said, well, you can't. You can't do it. You know, you're too small. You're just one of you. You can't save all of those dying shells. Those, uh, the creatures. And what he did is he picked up one by one and threw them back in the ocean. Yeah, it made a difference in that one. Picked up another one. Threw it back in the ocean. I made a difference with this one. Pick up another one, throw it in the ocean. I made a difference in that one. Picked up a starfish that's about to die, threw it in the ocean, I made a difference in that one. Take your time. That one person that you're ministering to, or you're pouring your life to, you know, going to make a difference, make, could be, could make an impact such as Apostle Paul in the living back in my life. The qualification for being used by God is not perfection, but progress. So we are on the last few verses, and then we're going to end with this. As I call on the worship team right now, from verse 26, the worship team right now. Yes, thank you. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. Wouldn't you? I would be afraid. 
not believing that he really was a disciple. And here's the phrase, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. Folks, we are at the last question, the fourth question, what is the process? On the next slide it says, what is the process? Everybody needs an encounter with Jesus. Number two, everybody needs an encounter with an Ananias. And number three, everybody needs an encounter with a Barnabas who would encourage you, endorse you, pray for you, be there for you through the tough times. Be there for you. Say, hey, we can do this together. I've been through that. Come on. Keep going. Don't worry. Don't give up. God has not given up. Given up on you. In summary, today we answered four questions. But I'd like to end with this in Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed the time of peace. It was strengthened. Who well, among you need strength this morning? I need strength. Living in fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, and it increased in numbers. What about this morning? And stand up right now. This is a sacred, sacred moment. This is the time I ask you. People, maybe you are on the fence sitting.
Jesus, I believe. Jesus, I believe.